Well, good morning, members of the Corps of Cadets, guests, and conferees here for the sixth annual VMI Leadership Conference. The theme being ethical dimensions in the digital age. We're pleased to welcome General Keith Alexander as our keynote speaker this morning. During his career, General Alexander served in many Army intelligence and security positions in the United States, Germany, Saudi Arabia, and Afghanistan, among others. Most recently, he was the commander of U.S. Cyber Command, director of the National Security Agency, and chief of the Central Security Service. And as commander of Cyber Command, he oversaw the planning, coordination, and conduct of operations of the Department of Defense computer networks as directed by U.S. Strategic Command. As director of NSA, he led a massive Department of Defense agency with national and foreign intelligence, combat support, and U.S. national security information protection responsibilities. He retired from the United States Army in 2014 and is currently president and CEO of IronNet Cybersecurity, a private company that provides cybersecurity training and consulting to private and public entities. As a key senior leader of America's cyber warriors, and as the leader of National Security Agency, when the Edwin Snowden disclosures were made public, General Alexander is especially qualified to speak on the difficult leadership choices and ethical dilemmas faced by national leaders engaged in protecting American national security. He is here with us today, also under the auspices of the H.B. Johnson, Jr. 26 Distinguished Lecture Series Speakers Program. The series was established in 1981 and was endowed by Belton Clyburg Johnson, a prominent Texas rancher and businessman who named the series after his father, a 1926 VMI graduate. Please welcome a close friend, a patriot, and highly respected leader, General Keith Alexander. What an honor and privilege it is to be here. Absolutely. You know, I was so honored that you are airing the haze in my honor today. I saw that all hanging over the balcony there. It's impressive. Um, perhaps more impressive is what you all go through to graduate and what you're doing here. And I'll tell you first, it's a great honor to be here and to see the quality of individuals that you all produce. In my career, I think there was one, or oh, there are several individuals, but one of the greatest was General P, uh, who was not only the 101st uh, Division Commander during the first Gulf War, but also the commander of CENTCOM. And I had an opportunity to serve briefly under his leadership. These are the kind of officers you produce. Sir, it's exceptional, and it was an honor and privilege to serve with you. Thanks for your service. Let's give him a big round of applause. That's the only way I was going to get an applause here today. Now, I do have a sense of humor. I'm, I, I, I do. And I think we learn by laughing, uh, even during serious times. And this is a serious topic, the ethical considerations of the digital age. Imagine what's going on, what you're living through, what you will live through, what you will lead our country through, is how to work the digital age to where we need it to provide the security for our country and ensure our civil liberties and privacy. Many people are going to give you a choice. Is it security or is it privacy? And I will tell you, I think it has to be both. And so the discussion that I'm going to start off today is my experience running the National Security Agency all the way up through the Snowden stuff and walk through what happened, what's going on, and what that means for some of these discussions. I'm going to leave about 20 minutes for questions, and I'll take any question that you have on, on these areas. So it is amazing what's going on today if you think about the technology that you have. 
And almost everybody in this room probably has an iPhone, an iPad, maybe a MacBook or a Microsoft Surface or some kind of laptop computer. And it's interesting, General P mentioned uh, last night, if you think of the first Gulf War just 25 years ago, we communicated with regular mail. My wife sent me letters and wrote me little and sent little video cassettes. That's how we communicated. We didn't have email like that just 25 years ago. Think about the rate of change. Technology is doubling every two years. The amount of unique information that will be created this year is more information than was created in the last 5,000 years combined. The top 10 in-demand jobs over the last couple of years didn't exist 10 years ago. What's that mean for you? That means those of you who are freshmen that are learning technology, half of what you learn this year will be outdated in two years. That means we are training students like you for jobs that don't exist using technology that hasn't been created to solve problems we don't even know are problems. Think about that. And so you're ha you will have to learn the basics, the fundamentals. And it starts with an honor code that you all have. Will not lie, cheat, or steal, or allow anyone else to. Same that we went through, that I went through. And that kind of an honor code you won't tolerate in others is what we need to take forward for our country and what should help us lead in this ethical debate. It's all about integrity. And I want to walk you through some of those things. Now, before we do on the tech, let me just finish up on technology. Why is this so important to you? You know, you are living in amazing times. You and your peers are going to be the generation that solves things like cancer and many of the things that plague us. You're going to bring in more new technology and all the things that will make our lives better and longer and all the complications from artificial intelligence and robotics to the policies that we put in place to ensure our security and our privacy. But as you add this all together, it also creates a series of vulnerabilities. And I want to walk through some of those vulnerabilities because that's really what started Cyber Command. If you think back in 2007, the country Estonia was hit with a distributed denial of service attack when they tipped over a monument, uh, a Stalin monument in Tallinn. And that monument, when it tipped over, the Russian government and hackers thought that it was wrong and they hit Estonia with the biggest distributed denial of service attack ever. It knocked them offline. Now Estonians vote online, bank online, they are the most connected society, 1.4 million people. It knocked them off the network for almost two weeks. It was huge. I talked to President Elvis after and it was a changing uh, a key change for their government, for their country. One year later, Georgia was hit with an attack by hackers again, and those hackers timed their attack on banks and government with Russian troops crossing the border into Georgia. I don't believe in coincidence as an intelligence officer, so you can see that the Russian government is behind some of that. Now, it's interesting, in the first I have a series of stories that I'd like to share with you. And the first one starts in 2008. In 2008, um, NSA, looking in foreign space, saw some Secretary of Defense classified information. We said, hmm, that probably shouldn't be there. And I think what you'll see and understand, the irony here, is that NSA was not authorized NSA was not authorized to look in the DOD networks without somebody inviting them in. So we went down, our guys went down, they knocked on the door, 
They said, we think you have a problem. The guys opened the door up and they said, these aren't the droids you're looking for. They, uh, so over the next six or seven days, we had to get permission to go in. Friday afternoon, 24 October, all bad things happen on a Friday afternoon. In fact, General Smith will know some of this because he was in parts of these things. Um, the guys knocked on my door to my office, 1630, and I, uh, they said, sir, bad news. I said, I know it's Friday afternoon. And they came in and they said, we found malware, in fact, 1,500 pieces of malicious software on the classified network. And I said, that can't be good. And they said, that's why you're the director. You picked right up on that. Um, and uh, so I turned around, I called Secretary Gates, I called Chairman Mullen, and uh, then I turned to these uh, five guys. And I said, okay, we found the problem, we gotta solve it. Come up with a technical solution to solve it. And we talked about that for about an hour, uh, how you build the encryption, how you build a platform, how you put all the software on it, and how you do it. And it's, my comment was, that doesn't sound like that should be too hard. How long would that take? Now, my job is to come up with a time. I thought, well, how about we do that in one day? Let's have it ready tomorrow. By Saturday, put it on there. They did. And it solved the problem Saturday. Now, nobody else in the world could have built a system like that. That's some of the stuff, the legacy, that some of the things that you will pick up. Nobody could have solved that. The next Monday, well, when the services came in, the first thing that the service chiefs and combatant commands wanted to do is count systems. Our comment was you were hacked. You didn't lose anything. Your systems are still here, you've just been hacked. Um, and Secretary Gates watched this. Now there's something in the military that those of you who go into the service will find out. No good deed goes unpunished. Secretary Gates called me back up on uh, 11 November and said, okay, you guys solved that problem, you solved it, you've been in charge of the offense. At that time, I was dual headed as director of NSA and the commander of the Joint Functional Component Command and that warfare, all the offensive forces. He said, well now, you have the defense, over to you. And so, uh, that was the beginning of Cyber Command. And with the offense and defensive forces, it was uh, a tremendous opportunity. I had the opportunity then to sit down with the commander of DISA, the Defense Information Systems Agency, and talk to him, so why did we get hacked? What happened? And, and what I learned is that the DOD networks had so many enclaves that they couldn't defend it. 15,000, you couldn't see it, it wasn't defensible, and we had a problem. Our people were trained at different levels, so we trained our signal folks at a secret level, we trained the intelligence at a top secret special. So the offense gets top secret, the defense gets secret. And you say, well, that doesn't make sense. Shouldn't we give them both the same? So we fix that. And a whole series of other issues. Now, as you jump forward, we predicted at that time that our nation was gonna face a series of, of more difficult attacks. And if you think about it, as you now may know, on that same network that we operate in cyberspace is the biggest source of information for solving terrorist problems. In fact, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the two programs that NSA ran that were divulged by Snowden, but I want you to hear first some of the stories of what they actually did. And I'll put these in time sequence and try to interleave these two. In 2009, 6 September, NSA was tracking a terrorist in Pakistan. And that individual sent an email to somebody in Colorado. Now under the FAA 702 program, we were authorized to track the contents of those outside the United States, known terrorists coming into the US. We got that from a service provider and we read it. Our job was to pass that information to the FBI. And this one talked about building a set of bombs and of conducting an attack and had a phone number. So we gave that to the FBI. The FBI takes that with a national security letter or a warrant and gets the name of whose account that is in the US. 
three days later, the FBI came back to NSA and said that email address and the phone number belonged to an individual named Najibul Azazi. You were then authorized under the metadata program to go look in there. This metadata program authorized us to, with date, time, group, duration, to, from, number, that's all, metadata, no content. In fact, we were often asked by congressional members, so how were you listening to the radio? Where was the content, or their phone calls? There's no content. But you were reading it, there's no content. You're listening to, there's no content. We said that about 20 times, and you still get asked that question, so you can now tell them there is no content. Uh, it almost became humorous if it wasn't so serious. Uh, but there is no content. But what it did allow us to do is to see that this guy Zazi was talking to like eight guys on the first hop, 20 on the second, and 30 on the third. And on the third, there were a series of terrorists outside the United States that came back to a central figure, sorry, and uh, that central figure, we said, ooh, that's bad. So we were able to, in, within an hour, under that program, give that back to the FBI and say, we think the guy in New York City is somebody you need to look at. The FBI can take that through the warranted process as well. About 11 September 2009, Zazi starts driving across the United States. The FBI gets concerned, and shortly thereafter, they police up the guy in New York City. And in his apartment, they find seven backpacks in various states of readiness to conduct an attack on the New York City subway. That would have been the biggest attack on U.S. soil since 9-11 and would have killed hundreds of people. Hundreds of people. That program stopped that. Now, um, it was a privilege and honor to serve as the director of NSA and the commander of Cyber Command. And, um, and the next story that comes up was in 2011. In 2011, um, we actually got a call, one of our people, so NSA tracks all hostages, tries to find out where they are and pass that to the appropriate authorities. And overseas and tracking this, there was a hostage, Jessica Buchanan, that was taken prisoner in Somalia by pirates. And the State Department heard that she was going to die in captivity if somebody didn't rescue her. And so uh, Secretary of State asked the Secretary of Defense to do an operation to go rescue her. And that, of course, would then go to Joint Special Ops Command. At the time, Lieutenant General Joe Votel was the commander of JSOC. And of course, JSOC said, that's great, we'll rescue her. Where is she? We don't know where she is. Who do you call? Ghostbusters. I mean, sorry. NSA. So NSA found her. So this is, this is a, a true story. So we built a battle bridge at NSA to help track these things. And it's, okay, it's not, so it's about the, big, the size of that screen. You get about six of these screens. We have imagery coming in from drones and other sources. And you're tracking. You have the intel. And we're talking to the guys at Joint Special Ops Command, to the folks on the ground. It's amazing. And you know that imagery, uh, when you think about the type of colors that come in, it's like just like the Clancy novel. It really is, except for better. You know, little white dots, you can see all of the bad guys and the good people, they all look the same. But you could figure out where everybody was, you could see that on the ground, you could see the JSOC teams moving in, and then cloud cover hit. And it's one of the terrorists pirates made a fatal mistake. They raised their weapon against JSOC. So I know one of you is going the SEALs. They took out all the pirates in about five seconds, all gone. Bad day for pirates, good day for Jessica. That's the NSA and the types of people that I knew, that I grew up with, that I was part of. And you know, it's the interesting part. My wife's in the back there and, you know, we couldn't talk about what we did there. So I would come home late at night and she'd tell you what happened, uh, just an issue that we dealt with, save Jessica Buchanan a whole thing, but couldn't tell her anything. Just said, yep, another day at the office. Another day at the office. And I'm sure she learned to read the newspaper and figure out, oh, well, last, yesterday they saved Buchanan. Took down this terrorist, or this happened. It was the most amazing thing. 
Now, I want to give you an insight on leadership, my experience on leadership, that I would encourage you, whether you go into government, uh, into military service, or into commercial life, that you take with you. And it's kind of funny. There's a, a couple stories. Uh, first, don't tease the Secretary of Defense. Write that down. Don't tease the Secretary I should have learned this when I, when I did. So uh, when I got to NSA, one of the things that I had to do was bi help build a new cryptologic platform because ours was canceled. And I went down and uh, Secretary Rumsfeld asked me to come in and brief him on it. And so I said, hey, Mr. Secretary, would you be happy with a 10% improvement a year? And he goes, that would be pretty good. And then I said, oh, I'm sorry, I meant 10 times a year. And it was at that point that he started to turn red and I knew I was not going to live to get out of that office. So I quickly raced through and told him all the things, and he quickly got back to normal. I made it out of there alive. That was Friday. Monday, he called me up, and he said, uh, I'd like you to meet me in the Oval Office. I want you to brief the president. So I go down to the White House, uh, and as the director of NSA, I actually was in the White House a lot, one, two, three times a month in the sit room. And so I go down and get in the Oval Office. It's me, President Bush, President Cheney, and Rumsfeld, just four of us. So I briefed that. And uh, I said, I think we can build a defensive system in cyber. And he nods, just like that. Good, good job, nod. Okay. And I said, okay, good. So I go back to NSA, and I tell our guys, good, cleared in hot, go build that. October, six months later, the president comes up. Now, this is at the time of the terror surveillance program. Okay, you can remember that coming out in the papers about nine, ten years ago, and all this stuff is going on. And he lands right in front of uh, our quarters on the big parade field. I come out and I salute him. Mr. President, welcome to Fort Meade. And he goes, General, get in the car. We got to talk. Just like that. That's how he sounded. And so I get in the car, and he kicked everybody out. He's in the jump seat. I'm in his seat. This is really kind of neat. I'm in the presidential sedan sitting there. They had removed all the ashtrays, so I didn't steal anything. And it was amazing. And so he goes, General, there's two problems. I hear there's two problems we've got to solve. First, they tell me you've got too many bosses. And I think, uh-oh, danger, Will Robinson. My boss is the president, the vice president, the chairman, the secretary of defense, the undersecretary of defense for intelligence, the director of national intelligence, STRATCOM. So who are you going to throw under the bus and live? So I, actually, they were all pretty good to me. They, they helped us, and nobody was too tough. So I told him that. I said, actually, it works out pretty good. And he goes, well, General, if that ever gets to be a problem, we'll fix it right away. I didn't ask, so who? Who are you going to get rid of? I should have asked that. And he goes, now, there's another problem. This terrorist surveillance program, it's going to get really bad. It's out in the press. It's going to be really bad. They're going to be all over everything on it. Here's the deal. You defend the country. I'll take the heat. He did. He was beat up in the press. He was vilified in the media. He never wavered. He never said NSA or anybody else. It was the greatest act of leadership I saw in 40 years. It's the kind of backbone that true leaders are made of. He was vilified. But he said, my job as president is to defend this nation. And he stood up for that. And it was something that, that struck me. I was so impressed. And then he had a press conference at NSA. And he stood there, and he had me and Vice President Cheney and McConnell and one other guy there, and was the four behind him. And he talked about the program and why he was doing it and why it was good for the country. And that was a program that would go under FISA and was done. So what, what uh, Snowden revealed in 2013 was what Bush talked about in 2006 publicly that was approved by Congress under the Patriot Act and then again. So as you think about those and moving forward, there were a number of things going on in these two programs. And in 2013, now we had a, a number of couple of other things, and this gets to the civil liberties and privacy. Snowden steals that information and races on his way to Venezuela 
He took a wrong turn and ended up in Hong Kong. I know it's hard to come in off that island. Got to Hong Kong and then went to Moscow in search of Venezuela. My story. And uh, so while all that's going on, if you recall, was the same time the IRS. So the White House said, well, we should do a presidential review of these programs to see if NSA is doing them correct. And I actually thought this is a great idea. And I knew they were going to do that. And we could get Colin Powell and we could get Condoleezza Rice and some of these luminaries to tell the American people what we're doing. And so I went down to the White House and I'm sitting at the sit room. Now this time, it's one, sh one person on one side of the table and all the national security staff, Susan Rice and everybody on the other. And I thought, hmm, this looks odd. It looks more like, you know, a trial. And a, so I, I sit down and they go, well, we're gonna do this presidential review group. And I said, great, we can put in these. And they said, well, we've already decided, already decided. And they slide these papers across the table and pull their hand back quickly. And you know it's not good when they do that. And so I get the first bio and I read it and it goes, yada, 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 board member of the ACLU. And I said, you gotta be kidding me. These guys are suing us and you're gonna have them do the investigation? And I said, well, the president has made his decision. So as a good soldier, I saluted and said, okay, I will do the right thing. We'll bring them all in. Over the next five weeks, we'll show them everything we did. So they come up to NSA. And the guy from the ACLU is sitting about like you, our arms crossed. He looked at me like, Luke. You know, like Darth Vader. And I looked at him somewhat askance, and I thought, hmm. So I thought, well, I'll tell him how this program works. And just to give you an idea of this program, the metadata program, what we did in order to meet the court's Fourth Amendment issues, if you put all that data into a bin, what you had to do is have some control over it and ensure that the only times you looked at it, it met certain provisions, you trained the people to a certain standard, that you did a 100% audit, and you shared that with Congress, the courts, and the administration, and if you made a mistake, you self-reported, and you did that every time. So we, we showed him and his group that then I said, well, it's better for the next five weeks instead of me doing this, why don't we have the young folks that run the program show you, which is what we did. Now, five weeks later, I come back into the room, and they had been in and out on, on certain days, and the guy, he stands up and he comes, he comes around that table, I think he's gonna attack me. I'm in pretty good shape, you know, I've been working out, I think I could take him, but he comes up and he shakes my hand. And he says, you and your people have the greatest integrity of any agency I know. I was stunned. But I quickly recovered and said, well, don't tell me, tell the White House, Congress, the American people and the people of NSA. And he said, I'll do that. So I'm gonna read you a statement that he made. And he said, to say I was skeptical of the NSA is in truth an understatement. I came away from my work on the review group with a view of NSA that I found quite surprising. Not only did I find that the NSA had helped to thwart numerous terrorist plots against the United States and its allies in the years since 9-11, but I also found that it is an organization that operates with a high degree of integrity and a deep commitment to the rule of law. Jeffrey Stone, Presidential Review Group member, Advisory Board for the ACLU, and acting dean at the University of Chicago Law School. And he told the, uh, the president the day after and a whole series of things came out of that. But what they had found in that review is not one person at NSA had done anything wrong. They had followed the orders and in every case that they had found something, they had self-reported already. 100%. He said that they came in there with all these ideas of what we should do for the compliance programs for these. And what he came away with was you were doing everything we could think of. You were doing everything we could think of. Now, I don't agree with the government holding the data, was his comment, and actually NSA didn't either. So interesting that an army officer who is somewhat conservative and a board member of the ACLU can come to the same point 
for a solution. And the point that we came to is we can do both. We can protect civil liberties and privacy, and we can protect this nation. And when you think about it, it isn't security or privacy, it's security and privacy. And so as you go through your careers, what made our country great was finding the right solution, not finding a position and sticking to it, but finding a solution that is good for this nation, that is important for our country. Now, I've got two more things that I want to walk you through because it's interesting. People said, we think you're hyping the terrorist threat. I'd get that. I'd say, well, really, you're in a different world than I am. So I want to give you a few statistics on the terrorism stuff that we've been tracking. And this is all public. You can go to the, what's called the START program at the University of Maryland and look this up. In fact, those of you who track terrorism, you might be interested because the 2015 results will be coming out soon. But for 2012, there were 6,771 attacks, 11,098 people killed. In 2013, 9,707 attacks, a 43% increase, 17,891 people killed, a 61% increase. In 2014, 13,463 attacks, a 39% increase, 32,727 people killed, 83% increase over 2013, and almost tripled the number in 2012. What's that say? It's getting out of hand. It's growing. We're not solving the war on terror. In fact, the Middle East is coming apart. It was an honor and privilege for me to serve at Central Command as the intelligence officer in 1998. I got there in 1998, and I thought, what a great place. They got palm trees here, it's warm, the beach. One August, 1998, I signed in. Seven days later, my whole world changed with the East Africa Embassy bombings. I never saw daylight again until I left. We come in early, leave late. That was when bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, conducted the attacks on the East Africa embassies, killed thousands of people, and somebody revealed the fact that NSA was tracking bin Laden in sat phones to the press, and it was reported in the press, and we never saw bin Laden in communications again, ever. What Snowden revealed about our programs has significantly impacted our war on terror. Because four months later, in the uh, fall of 2013, NSA had been the biggest agency for detecting terrorist communications and helping in Europe and in East Africa, Kenya. And after the Westgate uh, shootings, the Kenyans came to me and said, where were you? Why didn't you stop it? Why didn't you help us? And the answer is, we didn't see it. Because we've given it out. And so what many in the earlier administrations had worked to prevent attacks and to keep somewhat quiet is now in the public. And if you talk to any of the counterterrorism folks, what you'll find out is we have lost an incredible amount. So where does that bring us to? Well, perhaps the most important debate going on right now is the Apple iPhone debate, and many of you I know are interested in that. So you now know where I'm going to come down. Do we open the iPhone for security, or do we not open the iPhone for privacy, or do we find something in the middle? And my comment is we should work to collaborate for the good of the nation and do what's right. We can do both, and we should do both. Think about this. We're the nation that created the internet. We ought to be the ones that can secure it and protect our civil liberties and privacy and our security. We can and must do both. And I don't buy that it's either or. 
I don't buy it. And neither should you. You know, when people give you two bad solutions, I would look for a better one. I would look for a better one. And so what I find of great interest for the discussions today, it's not about are we going to be security or privacy. How do we build back a nation that can work together to create the solutions that we need to protect our people and to protect our privacy? That's what it's all about. And this is the greatest time. And you're going to have some of these. We save some of these problems for you. So you'd have something to do when you get out. So you're just lucky. No, actually, these are problems of your generation and ours that we have to solve together. And it will only work if, like Jeffrey Stone and I, people come together to say, I'm interested in doing what's right for the country. So I asked Jeffrey Stone, he and I did an op-ed on the, the metadata program to go ahead and park the data at the service providers. I was good with that. And he goes, well, why are you good with that? And I said, oh, I think it's fine. It's not an issue. In fact, we recommended it four years ago. And I said, why are you willing to do it? And here's what he said. If we don't give the tools to the people to stop terrorist attack, and we have another 9-11, we're not going to have privacy. So we have to come together to solve these problems. And I think that's right. That's what our country needs. And you know, it was very interesting that I learned from a board member of the ACLU, and he learned from an Army officer, that actually we could collaborate for the good of the country. We could work together. And I will tell you that now when people ask me, I'd say, well, shoot, why don't we ask Jeff Stone? He's an ACLU guy, but he'll give you a, a pretty fair shot at it. And he does the same thing. And so there is chance, there is an opportunity out there. So I'm going to wrap this up by just saying that when I went through at NSA, um, I worked pretty much every day of the week for eight years and eight months. It was amazing. And the, it was about 50-50 mix when you added in Cyber Command. We deployed over 6,000 people to Iraq and Afghanistan to help save the lives of our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines. And people would work 24 hours a day back at Fort Meade to help provide that coverage. On Christmas Day, I get a call from a guy named General Milley. He said, we got a problem. There was a bomb loose in the capital of Kabul, and he needed our help. Now, I did have a skiff in the basement, authorized, and special compartment, that was a joke, um, a special compartment. So I lived in quarters. I had this special compartment and in intelligence facility in my basement, monitored and tracked by NSA. And so I could go down there and handle that and call the White House and call all these places to ensure that we're providing the intel. Christmas morning, my wife and the kids, and I have 16 grandchildren, are up there ripping through all the presents, and we were down there. And the people of NSA were in and working. In eight years and eight months, for all those who came in on the weekends, worked nights, worked holidays, I never got one complaint because they knew what they were doing was saving lives and protecting this nation. What an honor and privilege it was to serve with those people who have been vilified about what they're doing to defend this country. Now you know the rest of the story. So thanks, thanks for what you do. Thanks for this great place you have here. We're gonna open it up for questions. Over there. Thank you, sir. Um, I was going to ask, how have the changes to the previous Patriot Law, um, that act, how has that affected our metadata analysis? And 
with that being said, have those changes affected our ability to track those terrorists? So the, the only change that really occurred was instead of storing the data at NSA, it's stored at these service providers. And so NSA would bring that data in together and kind of put it all in one place so you could search at one time. Now you'd have to search multiple times at multiple uh, providers. But I thought in 2011, some of our guys came up with that as a solution so that it didn't appear that NSA was wading through it. You now know that every time that database is touched, it had what we called emphatic access restriction. So anytime anybody touched it, a record was made. And any time you did a query, you had to show why you did it. And so the only thing that changed was where the data was kept, which, you know, if you think about the speed of light, I didn't care if it was kept at Fort Meade or if it was kept in the service providers. It's only 10 milliseconds. I'm sure we could deal with that, um, that decision space. So uh, that's the only change, and that was passed by Congress. But what doesn't come out in all of this is, you know, you know those things. So you don't get a report back that the review group, although they said all these nice things and Jeff Stone said that. Now he would also say, in his defense, he'd say, look, these are great people and they're doing a great job. We should never trust them. We should always watch and make sure they're doing right. Okay, I'm good with the oversight and compliance. Do it right and do the right thing for our country. What we do need to do though, are for those that serve in this area. Don't vilify them for doing what Congress, the courts, and the administration asked them to do. And that's where I think this whole system fell down. So that's where I push back on members of Congress that say, I had no idea. My comment is get some backbone. You approve this, you should tell the American people. And if you made a mistake, fess up. But most of them were just, you know, ran instead of standing like Stonewall Jackson would have. I got that in, right? <laughs> Next question, please. We have one over here? Oh, no, just take the jacket off. Whew, that was close, right? <laughs> Uh, sir, earlier in your speech, you said that all the information that had been disclosed by Edward Snowden was already public knowledge uh, based on the press conference held by President Bush. Um, if it was already public knowledge, how would uh, Edward Snowden's... Uh, yeah, so, okay, I can answer that. Let me just clarify. Cause a security yeah. di dilemma. So, so what was public knowledge was it, what was called the terrorist surveillance program was leaked in the press in 2005 that went under the FISA Amendment Act. And so the fact that the government was doing this was public knowledge. What wasn't public knowledge was the way it was done, the courts and the process was continuing. So what they did is they folded that under the FISA Amendment Act. So what Snowden revealed in that one thing was a classified memorandum from the court telling one of the service providers to provide that support to NSA. So it was a court order a classified top secret court order. Now, what I referred to is that people were, you know, everybody was outraged, but the fact that the government was doing that was revealed first in 2006 under the uh, terrorist surveillance program. But you ask a good one. So for clarity, Snowden stole about 1.5 million documents. And you can argue over plus or minus 200,000, depending on how many duplicates were. Um, one document, he revealed to reveal this program. The majority of the rest were classified documents about our military operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. Some of the information that was held by our allies, like the Brits and the Australians, and you saw that Miranda was stopped. And so the issue that really comes to bear is why would you take 1.5 million documents when you only needed to reveal this one if that was your point? And the answer, in my opinion, is there was a lot more going on. Because you don't flee to Venezuela the way he went, taking all those documents with him. And it's interesting, I'll just give you, I don't have all the facts in this. We don't have all the facts of what he did. And all we have is different parts of it. 
Uh, he got to Hong Kong on May 21st. He was there for 10 days before anybody knew he was there, and he started meeting with him. What did he do those 10 days? And then um, when you look at, it's now revealed about our collection activities against China, against Brazil, against some European leaders, and all these other things. And when you look at all the documents that were revealed, there were no documents on Russia that were revealed. Do you think NSA collects on Russia? So that seemed odd to me. I'm just inquiring minds want to know. So what really hurts is that terrorists didn't realize the full extent of what we were doing and how we were doing it. That's been revealed not only by Snowden, but by Greenwald and Applebaum and others, not just all that. So that's significantly impacted it. That's the bad part. Other questions? Please, right up here up front. I'll restate my question. Um, I think everybody's burning to know what's your opinion on the Apple iPhone uh, question? W what would be that, in your mind, that third solution, that, uh, that, that middle ground uh, between privacy and security? So my, my middle ground, and I don't have the solution in my pocket, but I have the way to drive to a solution. And you hit on it in part. So I'm not for a back door for security. I'm actually for a front door. Here's how we're going to help secure it. And I'm not for, um, you know, just don't give the, the law enforcement and the intel community anything. And so the question is, can we come up with a public key encryption capability that allows governments under court order to get the information that they need to stop terrorist attacks, to stop child pornography, to rescue people who need to be rescued. And if we don't come up with that solution now, while we have the time to think our way through it, if we have another big terrorist attack like 9-11 and people call, come to the intelligence agencies and they say, well, why didn't you stop it? And the answer is, we didn't see it. You can beat them up, but if you don't give them the tools, they're not going to see it. And so now we have the time to bring together the best mathematicians, cryptologists, technical people, government and commercial, form a group, solve the problem, lead the way for other countries to do this right. That's what I think we should do. I don't have a solution, but I know that there's, I, I know that just saying A or B isn't right. And so what I would do is turn to those of you. We need to come up with a solution. You know, it was it, at the beginning, they said, there's no way to have public key encryption. Oops, we did that, right? So is there a way to do this? And how do we build back trust and confidence that the government is doing it right? I am okay with the oversight. Bring in people to oversee it, government, court, Congress, all together, and maybe a third party that rotates on and off of those who are skeptic that are read in like the President's Review Group and let them see that our government is doing the right thing. Come up with a solution like that. And I think that's where we're going to have to go. Here's what I can't buy. I can't buy giving terrorists assured communications that they would be and could use to conduct an attack. I think that's wrong. Without trying, without doing something. And so, and it's not just going to be our country, it's going to be others. And I think this is going to grow. You know, I read you the terrorist statistics, but I didn't give you the rest of the story. Look at what's going on in the Middle East. It's coming apart. Egypt, 82 plus million people, 25% out of work. Those that want to make some money know that if they do jihad, 
they can earn some money for their family to get them to the next step. And they're going to take it. And we're going to fuel this fire. And we've got a problem. So we need the tools, and we also need to help fix the Middle East. That's going to be a problem for a while. But that's the way I'd start it. Next question. Excuse me. Way up there. Yes, I see you. I think it's there you go. See, even NSA can't hear you. <laughs> Regarding the FBI and Apple debate, if we have a <laughs> Regarding the FBI and Apple debate, um, you were saying we should have like a front door for, you know, the iPhones. Um, and Apple was saying that uh, their iPhone 6 was unhackable and then a hacker hacked it within the first 24 hours of it being released. So if we were to have a front door, how would we allow this so that like only the NSA or any governmental agency could access it, but you know, like a skilled hacker who could, you know, see this front door, not hack it and, you know, then sell it to the highest bidder, like Russia or China or uh, another enemy of ours. So step one, I think, is to solve this problem for our country first. Show that we can come up with a solution that works. And that would be, in this case, with an encryption system that is sufficiently large enough that any known computer system couldn't hack it and that you have a key that goes into it. Now, what Apple is concerned is if you have that key, who, who holds the key? Okay, so now you have a policy decision on who holds the key and under what circumstances do you use the key? So what I would advocate for is first, see if you can come up with that cryptologic solution, and second, can you come up with a policy framework that ensures that you will protect this and do it right? All, do all that, walk your way through it, and say, now is that a good solution? Is that better than where we are? And then what do you do for other countries like China, like Russia? And the issue comes in to what do they need to protect their citizens, and under what authorities do we deal with? The same thing in the European Union. I think what we have to do is start walking down that road. Because if we say we're only going to have A, and then bad things start to happen, that will be all drawn back. We'll have to start all, and that I think is crazy. Um, I actually was in a meeting where somebody said, well, for privacy, some people are going to have to die. Some people are going to have to die. I thought, that's crazy. The Constitution isn't a suicide pact. We built the Constitution to defend our people, not to make it so they have to die. That's the other guy. I think one of your other alumni here, George Patton, said, we're going to make them die for their country, not ours. Oh, okay, one year here. <laughs> and so think about that. Think about that. We want, we need a solution. Now, I don't have the solution. What I'm saying is get better minds together and come up with a set of solutions that we can pick up. But you picked up a great example. Apple said it can't be done, it can't be hacked. 24 hours later, it was hacked. Now they're saying there is no solution. And my comment is we haven't exhausted all the possi possibilities. Let's go look at those and do a good job on that. That's where I am. Next question. All right, Kim, Kim Zetter with Wired. I want to I want to follow up his question uh, regarding the hackability of the iPhone 6. Um, so we're at an impasse right now between Apple and the FBI and DOJ over this particular iPhone. A lot of people are wondering why the NSA doesn't just hack this and resolve this legal issue. Well, there would be something like legal issues. Uh, because Actually, I the, think I think there's warrant, I think so. there's two parts, two parts to this. One until FBI is authorized, NSA couldn't assist FBI under FBI authorities. That's part one. And two, where the phone is, it's actually guessing the password. And on the tenth guess, if you get it wrong, the phone is erased. If you get to that point, and they are at the point, so you get one guess, NSA could do an exhaustive 
attempt on that password, but you need more than one shot. And so the issue really comes down to, could NSA theoretically break it? Yeah, but it would take more than 10. And so what you're at right now is there is no miracle on that. The question is, can you reset that phone so it doesn't erase after 10 guesses? Then NSA or some other uh, uh, government agency could then crack the password. So that's the technical issue. So, so you're saying that there is no other method uh, other than doing a brute force password hack. So the NSA couldn't, for instance, take over the operating system that's on the baseband of the phone and take control of the phone that way, which, which wouldn't require a brute force password at all. <coughs> yeah, it, the, for what they're trying to solve, they couldn't do that. Now, there are things that NSA and other agencies could do, but it doesn't solve this particular problem. And in fact, this is the front door approach. NSA and no government agency wants to create a, a back door that says we can sneak in whenever we need to and get what we need to. What you really want is, I'll call it, I call it the front door. You want the government agencies, just like they've done in the past for phones and other forms of communications, to get a warrant and with a warrant, get the information they need. That's our process, that's our constitution, and that's what I think needs to be part of the solution. I, so I'm not for a back door, I'm for a front door, and we'll call it the warranted process. And in that warranted process, it gets back up to the two questions that preceded this, so how do you develop that? Well, that's what we've gotta go forth and find. Find that way. But the only way we're gonna find it is not by saying my way or my way, it's our way. Let's come together and find a solution that works. We had a question over here. Thank you. Thanks. That must be one of my relatives. Uh, we, we've integrated. Uh, can you hear me? Can no. you hear me? How about now? Oh, yep. there you go. Got yep. you. All right. So we've integrated uh, cyber warfare operations down to our unit level, troop level. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit to us, especially the cadets, about um, how we're making that operate. What's it like, both offense and defense in the field? So it's a, that's a great question. Um, first, how do you bring in this whole new form of warfare and train a force and then operate as part of a force? And, you know, one of the great things that our military did in the 80s was get together the combined arms approach. And that combined arms approach showed that the more that we act as a integrated force, the better off we are. And cyber is part of that integrated force. So it has to have and achieve objectives that the combatant command and subordinate commanders want to achieve. And what cyber would bring to this are different options that could be used, analogous to what you could use from an airplane, or a division on the ground, or a naval force, you now have a cyber force that can work in there as another course of action that can do a whole series of things in terms of going after an enemy's infrastructure. And if you look at Clausewitz, remember I'm a technical guy, not a military history, so this guy's been long gone, but if you look at his total war, what you're now looking at is what will be thrown at us in cyber. And I am concerned that those countries that wish us harm are gonna go after our energy sector like they did the Ukraine. They're gonna go after our financial sector like what happened in 2012, 2013. And we're not ready for it. So what we built Cyber Command on, and one of the things that I got Secretary Panetta, when I first got there, they said, your job is to defend DOD. And I said, I thought our job was to defend the country, not ourselves. And they said, General, you got your job. The nice part about being a four-star general, I found out, is you can disagree with, uh, with those. So I went to Panetta and said, I don't agree with that. That doesn't make sense. The mission was supposed to be defend the nation, not cyber, or not the Defense Department. And so I said, if a missile's coming into Denver, we don't look at it and say, is that gonna hit a military installation? Nope, let it go. I said, how do you think that'll be the next day in the press when they take down Wall Street? And they'll say, why didn't you stop it? We said, I don't have any money. I'm a military guy. We don't make money. Didn't know it wasn't going to impact us. We let it go. He said, I agree with you. So is it 2012 on the Intrepid? He changed our mission to do that. So to add the final part of your question, 
Cyber Command's mission is to defend this nation. The cyber legislation that's out there now lets Cyber Command do that to the maximum extent possible, but Cyber Command can't see what's hitting our industry. So that information sharing is going to be critical to our future at network speed so that we know when somebody's trying to take down a company like Sony, our nation can stop it. So I think those are the kinds of things that you're going to see, and it's going to start more on the defense, and then as a country goes after us, I'd think of countries like North Korea, Iran, and potentially Russia if they got mad about something on eastern Ukraine. We have to have the capability and the rules of engagement to stop that. That's where we need to get to. Next question? I, I have a question. Uh, I think this is the last question, right? Yes, yes sir. Um, over here, sir. Over I, here. Have a, I have a quick question. It's about um, Hillary Clinton's emails. Um, in your, I can't in your, see. I, um, for you, through your experience, having stuff that's been marked later top secret using, using her emails, um, what do you think of the ethical and legal stance on that, sir? Was this on the Clinton one? Yes, sir, the recent Clinton. Look at the time. Oh, we gotta go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I think it comes down to one thing. You know, at times, your execs do things that they think are helping you, and that may not be helping you. So the question I think that Secretary Clinton faces is, did she willfully tell people to cut headers off of classified information and put it on an unclassified network? If she did, I think that's an issue that has to be addressed, and I think that's what the FBI would probably look at. If she didn't, or it wasn't her that did that, but somebody was trying to do that, then I think uh, that thing will go away. So that's the real question. Did she willfully engage in misusing classified information to make it easier for her? I think that's what, that's what needs to be heard, and the guy who just got immunity, I think what we'll find out is what was his role and how did all that play. But, so but thank you, thank you. I think that's it, right? General P and the Corps of Cadets, I would like to thank you for your time here and give you this small token of our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Thanks.